Hi, and welcome to Robotics Today. My name is Luca Carlona, and I'm super excited to kick off this semester of Robotics Today with an exciting talk about the state of the art in area robotics from Skydio. So for those of you who have been living under a rock and don't know about Skydio, let me just mention a couple of things here. Skydio is currently the leading US drone manufacturer. And beside the beauty of their platforms, what really stands out is the advanced autonomy, autonomous navigation capabilities their drones have. While conventional drones feature a little bit more than waypoint navigation and obstacle detection, Skydio uses advanced computer vision and learning for localization, 3D reconstruction, and to track objects and people. And their drones are capable of impressive feats from capturing amazing videos to inspecting infrastructure and assisting police officers. These extraordinary feats did not go unnoticed, and Skydio has raised $170 million in funding since its inception in 2014. So today we have the pleasure to have not one, but two speakers from Skydio who will tell us all their secrets. So the first speaker is Adam Rai. Uh, Adam is co-founder and CEO at Skydio. He has two decades of experience with small drones, starting as a national champion uh, RC airplane pilot. Uh, Adam got his bachelor from Olin College and his master from MIT Aero Astro. Many of you will know Adam from his school papers on trajectory optimization and vision-based navigation in GPS denied environments. I really love, love them. After MIT, Adam co-founded Google's drone delivery project and was also recognized on MIT's TR35 list of young innovators. Currently, he's also serving on the FAA Drone Advisory Committee. Our second speaker is Haik Martiros, who was the first engineering hire at Skydio and now leads the autonomy team. Hike is a graduate of Stanford and Princeton. And before joining Skydio, he worked on all sorts of cool robots from uh, Exapor robots to robotics arm, micro robots and self-balancing motorcycles. How cool is that? Uh, at Skydio, his team's work in visual localization, obstacle avoidance and autonomous navigation is at the core of every Skydio drone. So Adam, Hike, thanks for being here and the stage is yours. Thank you, Luca. Thanks for the, the great introduction. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be here today. Um, as Luca mentioned, I think the, the roots of Skydio very much lie in academic research. Both Hike and I are fortunate to have, have worked in some really interesting labs doing really interesting stuff that in a lot of ways forms the basis for, for what we're doing at Skydio. Um, so I'm very excited today to, to be here with you to share more about what we're doing, uh, how it's going and, and where we see it going. So I will go ahead and share my screen. All right. So I wanna start with just a, a little bit of a history of conventional drones. Uh, a lot of folks may be familiar with this, but I, I think not everybody kind of has an understanding of where the drone of today comes from. So the, the heritage is very much in these kind of RC toys, these radio controlled helicopters that have been around for, for many decades. And traditionally these things had gas engines, they were very heavy, expensive, finicky. Uh, and one of the major breakthroughs that set us on the path to where we are today was the transition to electric propulsion. So this is of course not unique to drones, this is happening um, across the transportation industry, uh, but it was certainly a big step forward for these RC toys. They got smaller, lighter, easier to use. Um, the next was adding these MEMS, IMUs, and GPS, basically the same sensors that go into phone. Uh, and this is really the key enabling technology for quadcopters, where you can have uh, basic low-level stability and control um, to, to pulse the four motors to, to maintain the stability of the platform. Um, and then it turns out you take that quadcopter, you put a camera on it, and that just turned out to be a phenomenally useful, powerful product. Um, that we've seen really blossom, at least in a manually flown sense, over the last five or six years. Um, so I actually grew up flying radio controlled airplanes. So I've been, I've been playing with this stuff really for most of my life. And because I think most people don't have a sense of, of what these devices are really capable of, I sometimes like to show this video. So this isn't me, but this is one of the best pilots in the world flying a, a small RC model in a competition. So 
I like showing that video because I think it just illustrates that these, these small electric devices with really high thrust ratios are capable of just absolutely incredible things in the hands of an expert pilot. Um, so I spent a lot of time as a kid trying to get good at flying these things. And I was fortunate to be starting grad school at MIT around the time when people were first building quadcopters and putting computers and sensors on them and, and trying to get them to do smart stuff. Um, so this was a picture from 2007, uh, one of the original quadcopters. It's got a camera, a laser. Um, and when I got to the lab, we started work on this fixed wing project uh, that, uh, you know, the goal was to, to kind of take some of this technology and put it into a more aggressive dynamics environment. Um, so the, the main output of this project was an airplane that could fly itself around in a parking garage. So this is the parking garage under the Stata Center at MIT. Um, this is where I met my co-founders. And at the time we were just working on this stuff because it was interesting, challenging, seemed like it had a lot of potential. Uh, but this was before drones were really seen as an emerging technology category. And the motivation for starting Skydio was looking out in 2013, 2014, seeing all the amazing things that people wanted to do with drones for consumers capturing amazing video in the industrial world, doing inspection, mapping, monitoring, um, using drones for situational awareness, putting them into dangerous situations ahead of people and, and one day even doing delivery. So the concepts are amazing, but we felt like none of this stuff was really gonna work the way people wanted it to in a world where you needed to have kind of this one-to-one -one mapping between pilot uh, to drone. And this is what we've seen over the last five or six years is if you have a skilled pilot, if they know what they're doing, you can do some really incredible stuff. People are creating amazing video. The most forward leading organizations are starting to use drones for mapping, security, situational awareness. Uh, but we still think of this as really very early days for the industry, just kind of scratching the surface of what's possible. Um, and we think the, the future is pretty clearly autonomous and that's what we're trying to do as a company. We're trying to make the world more productive, creative and safe with autonomous flight. We see this as the beginning of a whole new category of device, um, kind of a flying computer that can usefully understand and interact with the world. Um, it's got an incredibly challenging array of technologies to, to make this possible. Um, and that's what we've been been focused on developing. So we've been at it for for seven years now. We've shipped two products. We're on the cusp of shipping a few more. Um, and I like to show this video. Um, so this is consumers using Skydio 2 over the last couple of years. Uh, this is uh, not our marketing material. This is just customers out there using and, and reacting to the product. Skydio was getting shots that I wouldn't have even thought of. Skydio 2 is absolutely insane. I can't even believe this thing, man. This is a game changer. Insanely dynamic shots that are effortless. This thing is crazy. It just avoids all these obstacles like nothing. Our personal helicopter pilot is here. Uh, so it's really exciting for us to, to get to see this. Um, you know, the, the target goal for this product was essentially a film crew that fits in your backpack that you can take with you anywhere in the world, pop it out. You don't have to fly it. It can follow you, avoid obstacles, and capture amazing video. Um, and we now have a, a really exciting array of content being developed by customers out there using this thing in, in all kinds of interesting, cool situations. Um, and a big part of our vision has always been using this kind of consumer platform, lightweight, integrated, easy to use to support other kinds of applications. Um, and for a lot of years over the last over the last 18 months or so, this is something that we're we're really leaning into um, and and using the kind of core products, the core technology to support these this this really expansive set of, of interesting applications. Um, so uh, with that, I will turn it over to Hike to talk about uh, really the the core engine that makes this stuff possible. Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about two topics. First, I'm gonna kind of talk about the core autonomy stack that allows our you know the autonomous flying camera. Um, that Adam was describing. And I think this uh, parts of this will be familiar to anyone working on robotics. And I'll just call out what some of the challenges are. Um, and I apologize in advance, there'll be a few text heavy slides. I'll just call out a couple things on them. And then I'm gonna dive into kind of one of the um, use cases to actually you know, use this flying camera and build on top of it to really uh, make, make uh, you know, a step change in, in what what's possible, the applications of these things. Um, and, and today I'm gonna to talk about 3D scanning as, as one of those application areas. Um, so the core autonomy stack that runs on all of our drones, basically the goal is to provide robust visual navigation in unknown environments, right? And the processing has to be on board. There's no assumption of you know, internet connection. And we just have to be able to handle kind of what's thrown at us when a customer buys our drone and takes it somewhere that we've never been. 
Um, so we need to estimate the robot's motion. We need to calibrate the sensors online. Of course, we can't crash into anything. That's kind of our, our core promise to our customers. Um, and then we need to uh, maneuver and, and plan intelligent paths based on our understanding of the scene and allow that motion planning to support kind of the higher level objectives that people want to build. And of course, as anyone working on real robots knows, system infrastructure is a huge part of that to just allow the architecture of the whole thing to work robustly and reliably and efficiently. Um, so what I think some of the big challenges here are just that, you know, I'll show slides of the, the many visual conditions that, that provide challenging photometric signals for computer vision. Um, flying at high speed especially is challenging from a control standpoint and just um, the fact that the drone is flying leaves very little room for failure, right? You have to respond quickly. Crashes are really bad. State estimation failures are really bad. Even hovering in place can be a, a bad in, in many cases, such as if someone's skiing down a hill. Um, and then, you know, when we, when we have a drone that's autonomous, there's really challenging human robot interaction problems because you you know, you assume that the drone is in control, but you also can't do things that are unpredictable to the user. So there's kind of this uncanny valley of if it's if it's not good enough, then you might be making things worse than just a, a manual drone would be doing. And so it's, it's very challenging to communicate what's happening in an effective way. Um, and of course, the constrained compute environment is, is always a, a limitation. Um, so I'm going to show just uh, an example visual scenario on the Skydio 2 here, which is our a mainline product that we shipped last year, which has these six 200 degree super fisheye navigation cameras that allow for 360 vision along with the 4K user camera. So if I show this video here, this is um, actually following our CTO Abe mountain biking and getting some cinematic footage. So you can see the drone is kind of flying in lead mode, which means it has to be in front of the person and anticipate their motions. And then we go around this, this tree and here it's more of a confined space. So the drone has to swing around and it's able to kind of keep getting a cinematic shot as it flies around and the user gets occluded. Um, so this is all done with uh, you know, the onboard visual tracking and, and navigation. And on that right side, you can see, you know, we have not just the user camera, but the full 360 context from the navigation cameras. And on the bottom right, the depth map that's uh, that's in play here that allows us to actually, you know, fly backwards while we're filming the person from the front. So this is showing what I think is a pretty successful autonomous uh, cinematography application. Um, and and the and the hard part here is really dealing with all of the difficult visual conditions that that we see. And and the bulk of these have to do with poor photometric signals, where you know you're you're getting 3D structure from pixels. But those pixels are not, um, you know, are not are not simple to just compare to each other because they they don't line up. Um, for example, things like sun glare um, or reflective surfaces or uh, just moving water all all um, act as very difficult challenges. And especially thin things like thin branches and electrical wires um, and textureless regions. Uh, like a desert or a snowfield or white walls or um, any number of things that happen with the cameras like snow and water on the lenses or dirt and smudges and fingerprints. Um, so this is a lot of what makes vision very challenging that we've put years of work into kind of handling and I think is a, a really funny video here. So this is a customer video from Instagram showing um, something that they were pretty excited about but we're fairly terrified by which is just flying through you know they're casually skateboarding down and the drone is up here um just trying to hold on for dear life through so many power lines with a very strong backlit sun behind um so this is an extremely challenging scenario that i think more or less we just you know we're trying but we, we could have well crashed i mean it's just it's very difficult to see even in the main camera here um so i don't advise anyone do this with a skydio drone but it is uh it is the kind of thing that, you know, that they, when they were doing this, they're not thinking about that. The drone is having a very extreme condition because for them, they're just skateboarding down a road, um, having fun. So, okay. So uh, I think the core of everything is, is a state estimation problem, right? We do visual state estimation. And of course we have GPS, but there are many cases like under bridges in RF, um, constrained environments like this under this, you know, this metal box that we're in this tube where that just doesn't work. Um, and fundamentally we, 
Um, our cameras are our rolling shutter, which is a challenge. We, we have to calibrate our cameras online and I'll, I'll call this out in the next couple of slides, but um, just estimating all the sensor parameters in our trajectory kind of underlies everything else. This needs to work all the time. Um, and rolling shutter is interesting because I, I don't think there's a lot of robots that do rolling shutter for, for high speed maneuvers and it, and it takes a lot of uh, close kind of direct modeling of uh, both translation and rotation effects. So if you're, you know, if you're flying quickly by a structure, the pixel shift caused by translation dependent rolling shutter effects is uh, non negligible. It's, it's actually much greater than the difference between say something being at 10 meters or 20 meters. Um, if you, if you start flying quickly near things. So um, we, we have, we model all of this in our systems in our estimation and our mapping systems. And it also requires very accurate synchronization between cameras and IMUs, um, which is a big part of why integrating all of the, the hardware, like building the hardware ourselves and the electronics and integrating everything is, is super key to getting good performance. Um, and we also calibrate our lens extrinsics and intrinsics online. Um, this is a pretty cool image showing that the, the lens intrinsics actually change quite a bit in a, in a temperature chamber here. Um, and, and these are again, meaningful shifts that we have to account for if you're say flying from, you know, you take off and the drone was indoors, but it's cold outside and, and these things change. It's, it's very much a meaningful uh, Delta. Um, and then of course, dynamic scenes, things like water and moving objects are challenging and uh, you know, inertial sensors can give a hint there. Um, there's kind of a nice complement with GPS if you're in this kind of scenario where, you know, the only close things are moving waves and a, and a boat, um, but you have to know to trust that. Um, and, and actually semantic information is one uh, area where you can, you can get a lot of insight there. If you, if you happen to know that this is water or people or moving objects, then you can really take advantage of that. And, and we do. Um, so on the obstacle avoidance front, I think we've, you know, we've put years of work into uh, avoiding uh, thin objects and textures regions and, and difficult photometric things. Um, so we, um, these are some visualizations showing the, you know, the types of local obstacle maps that, that we're building. And we published a paper uh, on, I think it was the first kind of paper that combined deep learning uh, with these 3D structure of stereo problems to kind of learn that end to end. So there was a cost volume step here and a, and a regularization step that's, that's learned. And I think that was a really interesting step for us because we had hit the limits of what um, a kind of classical stereo method uh, could do in cases where photometric consistency is just not present. Um, and learning really enabled us to improve from data automatically. And, and we have a, a large amount of real data. Um, this is challenging because we don't have ground truth for the real data. So we have to think about how to best leverage that um, through different techniques. Um, so that's, that's a huge uh, area of interest for us is, you know, unsupervised and self-supervised approaches to be able to leverage real data from real failures um, and, and not failures to automatically improve our system. Um, and, and this paper, you know, happened to, it was published in 2017 and it ran at about one frame per second. And since then, you know, we, we shipped this system on the Scadio 2. We had to speed it up by about a thousand times. Um, and um, it's, it's just been very successful for us. Um, but it, it definitely takes a lot of investment to put a deep learning system into production because of all the challenges with generalization, interpretability, um, that, that need to be understood and, and of course, performance. Um, so I'll quickly show a couple of snippets here of just the, the results that we see on the Skydio 2 platform. So this would be a forest example. Um, it's a point cloud and then like the power line scene. Um, so a lot of what we see in our navigation cameras when, when there is signal in the pixels, we're, we're pretty close to you know, seeing the, the wires in, in the cases where you as a human can easily spot them as well. So I, I would argue that we're um, uh, close to human performance on obstacle avoidance from our navigation cameras. Um, that I think that depends a lot on the context because humans can, in some cases, have a lot more semantic information, but from a geometric kind of um, set of images, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I would make that claim. 
And then this is flying through our indoor office. So you can see some very close kind of specular or textureless walls here um, that, that I, I don't think would be possible without a learning based method. Okay. Um, and then on the planning and control side, so at, at the core of our system, we have a unified optimization problem that takes into account a lot of low level and high level objectives that's um, optimized for the, the rotor rates and the trajectory of the vehicle over a time horizon. Um, and we have to account for the dynamics of the robot um, and just uh, what's, what's nice and unified about our system is that we can treat the actuator limits as the true limits rather than having kind of a um, an approximation and then relying on the interaction between a, a planner and controller. We still have a lower level controller that runs quickly, but by having a, a unified optimization that can reason about obstacles, low level dynamics, cinematics, um, and, and run that at uh, kind of 500 steps a second at the planner level, we can get a lot more um, connection to the low level performance of the vehicle and, and push the limits. And, and we actually push that all the way down to our own custom motor control software so that we can vertically integrate the, the whole stack as closely as possible. Um, and then on top of this planning system, we have a kind of an API layer that allows you to control a drone um, actually from a Python layer in a way that you can't crash the drone and is, is as effective as possible there um, in allowing you to build high level applications quickly without um, risking the sort of, or worrying about the low level details of the performance. Um, and then uh, I'm not going to call out a lot of this stuff, but we, we have made huge investments into kind of leveraging log data, leveraging simulation, um, the online architecture that, that allows everything to run and communicate on board the drone. And uh, we've also invested a lot in our own kind of infrastructure for optimization and code generation and just allowing us to be as efficient as possible and to, to create new algorithms within our team. Um, so open problems here, I think, uh, you know, we're, I would argue that we're at the, the, the state where, you know, the autonomy of a flying robot is, is good enough to be successful, to really make, um, make a difference in a lot of industries and, and be useful and be safer and cheaper than, than alternatives by, by far. Um, and we, I think we've just got here and the ceiling is, is really high compared to where we are now. Um, we can you know, we should be able to get to a place where we just have something that fits in your pocket that is just much lighter, much cheaper, takes less power, and just um, is, is just absolutely a kind of a, a boring level of technology, right? Right now, when we show obstacle avoidance, it's this cool, exciting thing. And we need to get to the level of it's just, um, it's, it's very unexpected for such a drone to, to crash and, and cause a problem. And I think that will mean that it's no longer kind of this state-of-the-art AI, but it's become actually mainstream robotics technology, which really should be our goal. Um, so things like 360 scene understanding of, you know, the robot is not just building a geometric map, but it knows what's around, it's mapping, you know, people, structures, it, it understands what's a doorway and it, it predicts the future motion of things, um, especially as it regards to moving objects. Um, I think low light is a really interesting uh, area of exploration. Um, that, that the research community has been pushing towards. And of course, manipulators are very exciting um, for things like contact inspection and uh, moving around payloads and delivery. Um, so I think that, that that's what I think of as the, you know, the areas we can really push on in the, the core autonomy system. But also uh, I think because we're at this good enough to succeed point, we can really build on top of that to push towards these applications. So. You know, the, the video that Adam showed of the, the pilot at the very start, I don't think we're close to that in terms of our dynamic maneuverability. And uh, if you look at the best FPV pilots in their uh, shooting of cinematography and planning out their scenes, there's some, there's some absolutely incredible stuff that we can aspire to. Um, and situational awareness, similarly, I think, you know, giving that the full understanding geometric and semantic um, being able to go into a building and, and show a floor plan and um, uh, the x-ray vision is kind of a cool uh, concept where, you know, you can actually use the drone to see behind things if you were aligning the, the scene in, in AR. So those kinds of things get me incredibly excited. Um, and then with regards to inspection and mapping, I think there's, there's an enormous area to just explore there with 
um, the, the capability the drone has to get within, you know, a, a couple of feet of things means that we can get, we should be able to do millimeter scale mapping. And, and I think with time, we'll be able to do that in, in real time and, you know, basically be able to make Google Earth a thousand times the resolution that it is today. Um, so I basically uh, want to dive into one of the applications, which is the inspection and mapping, because that's been a lot of um, focus of the, uh, the autonomy team this year and, and, and talk about this product called 3D Scan. And uh, the basic idea here is that 3D Scan allows the Skydio drone to autonomously map any volume and capture all the imagery you need so that you can build a very high quality detail 3D model after the flight. And it does this by basically building a low poly 3D model while it's flying so that it knows how to capture all of the surfaces and get the right data for photogrammetry. So I'll show an example of what, what I mean here by a high quality 3D model. So this video is showing something that I captured uh, last weekend using 3D scan and then, and then processed with photogrammetry software. So you can see here kind of the level of detail where you have structure on the, the bolts that are shown here and a uh, high level of uh, texture detail. And this is something I think will be referred to in, in a lot of industries as a digital twin, where basically you have a digital representation of some physical structure and you can use this for many different applications. So you can, you know, you can look for damage, rust and cracks. Um, you can do planning of new construction based on this and do measurements or store it for change detection later. You can also use it for game engine assets, VR, uh, just preserve it if something is getting demolished or is going to fade over time. Um, so there's, there's a huge number of areas where this is useful in a huge number of industries. And just to highlight that, um, I think if you, if you drive around and, and look around, you'll see that, you know, the world is kind of built with all of this critical infrastructure that kind of runs society and, and all of these things need to be maintained and inspected and mapped. And it's, uh, they're enormous industries, basically every, every one of these um, that we think we can uh, make a difference with, with this, you know, flying camera with just software on top. Um, so that's incredibly exciting. Uh, so the, the basic premise of 3D scan is that the user will specify a 3D volume and then you choose certain capture settings, like what resolution you want on the surface um, and, and you hit go. And basically with, with no assumption of GPS or a prior map, the, the drone will move around the map, build a real-time 3D model, and then capture detailed imagery of all the surfaces so that you can build a very high quality model offline. And, and the reason this is really compelling, so you know, if, if you're an expert pilot and you know exactly how to capture data and process it right now, you can, you can get these kind of reconstructions. Um, but what we want to do is, is really democratize that and make it so that anyone with this inexpensive hardware and the software can just, can just do this and make it dramatically easier to do. Um, and, and the alternatives of you know, using laser scanners on the ground is very expensive and time consuming and you can't get above things or uh, you know, the standard kind of drone lawnmower pattern is just... Um, it, it works if you're scanning a planar surface, but if you want to scan a complex structure like this one, you can't just fly a lawnmower above. You need to actually understand and see the structure so that you can, um, you can map it and, and capture it. Uh, so the, the set of algorithms to do this, you know, we, we, have our, we have our course VIO system and obstacle avoidance system, but, but those aren't suitable for this task because the state estimation system is meant to, it's optimized for a very different set of things. It's meant to be very robust, but it will drift over time. And similarly, the local obstacle map is, um, is, op is, is local, it drifts, it's optimized to just represent very thin objects in a, in a chunky way so that we can avoid them. Um, so we built a entirely new kind of algorithmic layer that runs in flight for global state estimation and map building to support this scanning use case um, because Basically, to it's this bit of a chicken and egg because to build a high quality 3D model, you need imagery of all the surfaces in a way that's kind of normal to the surface at the right distance. And to do that, we basically need the 3D model in flight. So what we do is we build the 3D model in a lower resolution way and then use that to, to capture imagery. So in the, in the bottom right here, you can kind of see that, that happening as we explore around a scene and, and build that consistent map. And that map actually needs to be consistent, you know, not just throughout a whole flight, but between multiple flights and between multiple drones. Um, because often these, 
you know, uh, a, a large bridge might take somebody a month to actually inspect going out every day, um, just flying manually for hours, collecting uh, tens of thousands of photos. And, and we've actually heard stories, things like it can take uh, weeks or months to process the data afterwards to really build that 3D model. And a lot of what drives this is it's very expensive to go back out to the scene again. So you're, you're really worried about capturing the right data. You might capture way too much data. You might have gaps. So this is all super ripe for automation. Um, so I just want to talk about why these problems are, are different. I think uh, the VIO problem is, I think, familiar to many. But the, the things that it's optimized for are robustness and speed. Um, so in, in this kind of traditional setup of the problem, we might have a fixed window of past poses and landmarks that we're tracking and um, maybe IMU biases and camera calibrations. And uh, the way our system runs is we pass this fixed window, we, uh, we will marginalize the information, assuming that we have kind of the correct linearization point. Um, and we don't, you know, we don't close loops, we can't keep an unbounded history to run online. And so the system, you know, will, will drift and, and you can't rely on that for long-term localization. And the, you know, more traditional structure for motion problem that's run offline um, for, for photogrammetry purposes typically is optimized for very consistent and high accuracy poses and is uh, typically an offline because it has arbitrary large number of poses. Um, and so, for example, in the top right here would be the the, the structure of a, a Hessian and the optimization problem of, of such a thing where you you have a lot of um, connections from poses to, to landmarks and um, it's, you know, it's a challenging problem to figure out how to run that online in a way where you can build an arbitrarily large map and still align to it while you're flying. Um, and, and we've worked hard at uh, basically doing that problem in a way that's, that's bounded and runs on top of the core autonomy stack. Um, and, and so on the bottom right here, you can kind of see an example of what we call a pose graph of the, um, that crane structure and all the connections between the, the viewpoints um, that, that are needed to, to localize this. Um, and, and some of the advantages we have here are, one, we have our online autonomy system to start from. So we have great initial guesses. And we're not just running off the photos like a photogrammetry package, but we have, um, we have our 360 cameras that add to this. We have um, stereo vision. So we're not relying on, it's not a scale-free problem. We have, we have metric scale information. Um, we also control the flight path and capture. So we're not just um, dependent on hoping to align a set of photos. Uh, we have a lot of control over making sure the graph is well connected, which helps us a lot. And we also have a, a shared deep learning core and, and a geometric core between all our systems here that we've spent years optimizing. So it, it helps a lot for this problem. Um, so, so beyond that, uh, we also need to build a 3D model that is globally consistent um, in conjunction. And we've kind of tightly integrated this with our global state estimation system. Um, and the interesting thing here is we're going to have to come up with a, a plan to basically cover all of the surfaces. So we need to, one way to think about it is we're trying to paint all of the surfaces with imagery and not just one image, but multiple images with the right amount of baseline such that it can be effectively matched and triangulated to build a high quality 3D model. So this is a pretty interesting visualization on the bottom left here, which shows um, the, the mesh within uh, what the 3D volume that we we're aiming to scan. And then it shows a uh, coverage here. So um, the, the legend here shows areas where you maybe only had one or two images or they were at poor oblique angles that may be worse for reconstruction. So we built this kind of metric to be able to judge um, the, the, any capture strategy in an objective way. Um, and this is obviously kind of a poor capture strategy because you can see, you know, the goal should be that everything is, is great. Um, and, and we've made a lot of changes since then. So it's a very helpful metric to have. It's also incredibly helpful for a user. So if you imagine, even if they're flying around manually, having this kind of tracking is, is uh, very useful and something we can show in, uh, in augmented reality as they're flying. Because um, you know, if you're an expert pilot and capturing tens of thousands of photos, it's, it's very difficult to keep in your mind what you've captured already and what you haven't, which is what leads to a lot of the acquisition problems, um, which is 
the biggest cause of poor 3D models. Um, so on top of these models, we, yeah, we need to plan a path to cover everything. So you can think about this as kind of a, an optimization problem where you're, you're, you're trying to get some metric of coverage. You're trying to optimize this metric of coverage within some bound, right? You don't, um, so you have to get good enough coverage of everything on the surface, but you want to minimize the time it takes to do that. And you want to minimize, um, the kind of unpredictability of, of going back and forth. And, um, there is a lot of work that we've done to think about how to, how to do that effectively. I mean, in general, it's, it's a very hard problem to, to think about it here, but is a couple of examples of, you know, some, there's a CAD model on the left here of, of some of the, the capture paths that, that we think make a lot of sense. Um, and at click here, there's some real world examples and the crane we saw at the start on the, on the very right. So this is kind of the, one type of interesting uh, capture path that's that's good for these structures and, and shows why it, it's really important to have that 3D model and you can't just you can't just plan this kind of path without uh, as a as a fixed path following GPS waypoints, right? Um, so this is an example of exploring this crane. So once that 3D volume is specified, this is showing the, the drone flying around and, and building a, an initial version of that, of that 3D model that can be used. So you can think of this as kind of an exploration phase where it's, it's going in and out of the nooks and crannies and just getting information. Um, and then after this, it would uh, go in and, and start capturing the the photos and kind of dynamically replanning and updating what it's, what it's getting. So this is this is the way that uh, 3D scan uh, works, and I think I'll I'll end with uh, one more example of just uh, an asset that was that was captured in um, you know 30 minutes and and processed. And it's it's I think it's pretty amazing that um, you can have somebody who's not an expert drone pilot but knows how to you know with some basic training can go and and uh, make this kind of digital twin in an hour. Um, so I think that's you know that that's that's hopefully showing one of the, you know, going deep on one of the applications of what you can do with a flying camera plus, plus the autonomy layer plus software for a high level application. Okay, I think uh, then I'll, uh, I'll pass it off to, to Adam to talk about customers. All right, um, can, I, uh, can I take the screen share back here? Like, yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, for me, one of the most exciting things about this, and I'm prone to being a, a bit biased here, but I think drones, potentially more than any other robotics technology, are in this really exciting sweet spot where the leading edge of of research and and pushing the forefront of these algorithms is is right in a zone where it's immediately useful and accessible for customers like self-driving cars to pick another example are a technology area where clearly there's enormous value but there's kind of this hard step function where self-driving technology is not very valuable until it works well enough to be better than a person and deployed ubiquitously and then it becomes extremely valuable whereas as drones are drones right now today um, with the technology stack that we have are, are already doing a lot of useful stuff um, and i think you know, somebody who loves developing these algorithms, it's incredibly fun to get to go and spend time on the ground with customers, see what they're doing with the product, see where it's working, see where it's not, and feed that back into our development process. So I'm just going to show a couple of examples here. So um, we partnered with a company, Eagle View, that does residential uh, roof insurance claims processing work. So after a storm comes through town, uh, you, you need to inspect the roofs to, to look for hail damage and, and assess whether or not you need to replace it. Um, and this is a use case that people have been talking about doing with drones for years, but nobody's really been able to make work in a manually flown context uh, because it's a very challenging task. There's obstacles around the data capture requirements are, are quite stringent. Um, so using a, a variation of 3D scan that's specifically tuned for residential roofs, we can essentially fully automate this. Um, and this is, we believe, the largest ever commercial drone deal. So this is 5,000 drones over three years deployed across the country being used right now for these kinds of residential uh, roof insurance claims processing. Um, and in fact, a lot of the motivation for, for developing these kinds of products has come from spending time on the ground with these folks and, and seeing what they want to do and, and figuring out ways that we can enable it. 
Um, so, you know, another example of this, uh, working with uh, a number of engineering firms around the world that do these kinds of industrial inspection tasks. Um, so after a storm, they need to un inspect the underside of, of one of these piers. Um, and traditionally, they would do this with a team of divers that kind of floats around in the water trying to take pictures of this stuff, uh, take a week or more. And with Skydio drones, um, they can do it in just a, a few hours. Um, we also work with organizations like Civil Air Patrol. So this is kind of the domestic wing of the, the, uh, the Air Force. They do a lot of emergency response, uh, search and rescue, situational awareness type work. Um, and Skydio 2 right now is enabling them to fly missions that they otherwise would not be able to do where they're flying into these tight places um, to, to get useful information. Uh, they have a much lower training barrier for their products. Um, and then the long term for this, I think, is even more exciting. So we talk about this kind of arc of autonomy. And we're on the right now, we're kind of on the left half of this diagram where our products are being used today, better collision avoidance, precision visual navigation with products like 3D scan, where we're automating these workflows. Uh, and, and, you know, these are valuable in and of themselves, but they're, they're really exciting stepping stones towards this more automated future. Um, so one of the products that's in development for us right now, we call the DOC where the drone lives in an internet connected charging base. It can be flown over the internet, dispatched whenever it needs to. Um, and we see this as a pretty important coming paradigm shift for the industry, where you go from sort of this one-to-one -one on the ground operation to one-to-one -to -one remote. And once you do that and it becomes more software defined, you can go one-to-many. Uh, and then the crazy sci-fi future that I actually think is not that far away is this world where drone exists, drones exist as a service um, where the people that use and benefit from drones never have to actually buy one or physically interact with it. And you can imagine having these things deployed around cities and the same drone can be responding to a 911 call, could be inspecting a building, it could even be filming a kid's soccer game. Um, and, and the more applications you can come up with, the higher the utilization is. Uh, and in some ways, these things become like cloud servers that just kind of live in the background, perform useful services and are available as, uh, as installed infrastructure. So, you know, that's not where we are today. Um, and there's really exciting technology and, and business opportunity to be had uh, with, with the stuff that's immediately in front of us. Um, but this is generally what we're, we're building towards and I think is a pretty exciting future for, for the industry. Um, and a really exciting, I think, you know, one of the first really widely deployed examples of, of mobile robots. Um, so uh, our, our final point here is just that the, the thing that makes all this possible is really just a phenomenal team across the board um, Hike leads the core autonomy team, but uh, we're building around that all kinds of software, hardware, infrastructure, um, marketing, sales, everything that it takes to, to build and support these products. So uh, if you're interested in these kinds of challenges, you know, we still think we're much closer to the beginning uh, than, than steady state or, or the end of this. Uh, and there's just more and more exciting stuff happening. We'd, we'd, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and with that, I will, uh, I will stop and, and I think we might have some questions from the panelists. All right. Um, I think Adam, I think you're still sharing your screen. There you go. Excellent. Um, thanks. That was a great, exciting talk. Thanks, Adam and Hake. Um, or I, I don't know, lots of uh, technical market questions come to mind. And uh, for that, we're gonna transition to the panel discussion where um, we're joined with the uh, usual suspects, uh, Jeanette, uh, Luca, Monroe, as well as uh, today we have uh, Benoit and uh, Robert who are going to be um, sort of looking at the questions from the audience. Um, remember if you're in the audience that uh, there's an interface below the uh, the screening view where you can post or rank your questions. And um, finally, we're lucky to be joined by two experts in the field uh, with whom we uh, we rely to ask the hard questions, um, Margarita and Davide. Um, Margarita um, uh, uh, he, she's assistant uh, professor and director of the vision for robotics lab at ETH. And uh, Davide Scaramuza, he's professor and director of the robotics and perceptions uh, group at the University of Zurich. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. And um, Margarita, do you, do you wanna go first? Absolutely, thank you, uh, Alberto. And uh, thank you guys for the great talk. Um, it's always amazing to watch Skydio videos. 
uh, let alone to watch your um, uh, talk and see also what's a little bit on the inside. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's uh, always a really nice thing to watch these videos and see how well Skydio is performing. And it's always a bit of a miracle to me on how you guys made um, obstacle avoidance work so well in these uh, visually degraded scenarios that some of them you show also in uh, the promo videos that we've seen in this talk, for example, a little bit with dust, a little bit with uh, branches overhanging trees. Um, so I was wondering, is this all learning based that you have on the background there? Yeah, so I can speak to this as well. I mean, I think that the transition, he alluded to this in the talk, but the transition from kind of classical computer vision techniques, which is more what we started with and our first product R1 was based on, uh, to the, the deep learned approach was a huge bump up in performance um, and was really a, a very aggressive uh, technical bet that we made that the team would be able to pull that off. Uh, but um, it, it just gives us, you know, the, the results that we've seen there, I think, are, are way beyond what anything we got with the, the classical techniques. And there's also a, a sort of more powerful feedback loop where when we see issues, we can either use directly data from the issues or an ability to, to replicate and simulate that to improve the problem in a more natural way than you can uh, with, with classical techniques. Yeah, so I guess you're hinting at a lot of my questions. I have a a lot of questions, but um, maybe it's interesting also to know how much of, of this learning based recognition or, you know, um, scene understanding is it or reconstruction? Is it run on the drone itself and how much it's out of it? You want to take that hike? Sure. Uh, yeah. So everything that the Skydio drone nominally does is, is run on board the drone um, because while you may have a cell phone connected and that cell phone might have a connection to the cloud and in the future there may be, um, there, well, there's a, there's a ton of amazing things you can do when you have that ability, but at the core for obstacle avoidance for uh, navigation, we can't rely on that because our drone operates in a place where you don't have internet. Um, so we, yeah, all, all of that is, is run on board. Mm -hmm. And uh, two sub questions on this, just to close this uh, loop. Um, do you do any online learning at all? Or is it really, um, as uh, Adam mentioned earlier, that you guys learn later from potential failure cases to train more on that? Yeah, I would, I would say that we, we uh, the things we do online are more in the realm of uh, fitting models that have a fixed form. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're not training our deep networks here online, um, but there are a lot of things that get, that get fit and adapted online from, um, from wind estimates to air density, to camera and lens parameters, to, uh, sensor parameters and air, you know, so th there's a wide range of things that, that get fit there, but I think the, you know, we, we, I think that's something we would love to do and is, and is even more of a challenge from, uh, you know, from a computational perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so basically you've shown quite some amazing uh, um, use cases, the, the power lines with the sunlight in the background. Um, yeah, it looks really magic as you mentioned, but also I was wondering how Skydio would perform in like tunnels of trees where you have uh you know the the image is split between uh, direct sunlight probably or maybe not direct sunlight but a really a sunny uh well lit scene and partially is in the shadow is that something you can actually learn um to to learn the depth of the scene from that uh yeah so i think in a, in a high dynamic range scene like the one you're describing i think it it kind of starts with the camera hardware so it, it really matters. And the low level processing that happens there to, to get the pixels up to the autonomy system. So cameras that perform better in low light in the extreme case, things like event cameras, but there, there's a lot of research happening there and uh, uh, computational pho photography techniques to improve that. Um, so, you know, we've, we've put effort into that on, on our drone. Um, and, and I think we do pretty well in those types of scenes, um, but ultimately it comes down to what's available in the pixels 
I think we've pushed the learning technique enough that if there's data in the, if there's geometric data in the pixels and we, we, we've seen enough of it to basically be able to train for that, it we can do some pretty magical things there. Um, and, you know, I think we like to use the techniques for where they, the way they really shine. Right. So we, you know, we don't just deep learn everything. We, we have a, a ton of 3d vision and optimization that, that happens around it with classical techniques. Um, but in terms of pulling out, uh, geometric data from cases where photometric consistency is difficult. Um, that's, you know, deep learning is, is astonishing in its performance there. Okay, so, but from reading, correct me if I'm wrong, from what I hear from your answer, that is such scenes that you have a high dynamic range and basically low visibility, it's still an open problem also for Skydio. Yeah, I mean, I think that, well, I would say there, there's just a limit on on everything there. So we've done a lot of work to perform as well as we can in those scenes. And those are those come up all the time with customers. We have people who are like mountain biking down trails where you have sun streaking in and out, um, where you go from very high light to low light. Uh, and we, you know, we, we generally perform well there, but at some limit, um, things will things will break down. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think we see throughout, and I think this is a common theme in robotics, is that it's, it's really a full stack problem. Um, so one of the reasons why we picked rolling shutter cameras, for example, is they're algorithmically a bit more challenging, but on a size weight cost basis, you get better dynamic range, better sensitivity, lower noise uh, because of the, the physical sensor itself. Um, and we tend to wait more in that direction. Like we pick sensors that are getting to give us some signal, even if interpreting that signal is, is more difficult. Um, and then we also control the exposure. So we've put a lot of work into the algorithm that, that tunes the exposure on all the cameras to synchronize them and go high and go low as appropriate to, to try to pull out as much data as we can. Okay, thank you very much. So, I mean, I can take a, I can do other questions, but maybe in a later stage, I'll also leave the stage for others as well. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Hey guys. <laughs> you wanna go, Davide? Yes. So first of all, I would like to, to thank you for this inspiring talk and also for existing. I think you have been inspiring a lot of people to jump into robotics, not just drones, but uh, robotics. I think a, a, a drone is actually uh, one of the best uh, examples of autonomous uh, machines that we can see. And it's, as you said, uh, there is a, you know, a very hard uh, step to go into something that, uh, you know, it's uh, available today compared to what will be available in the future by like full uh, autonomous cars. Now, I have a few questions. So you mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation that uh, uh, you would like to be able to uh, achieve the same performances as uh, an FPV human pilot. So, so how much do you still lack behind human pilots, uh, which can fly faster and more agile, supposedly? So what is missing to reach the human baseline? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I don't think there's a simple answer to that because there's so much diversity out there in terms of what human pilots are capable of. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've got, anecdotally, we've gotten to the point where people sometimes confuse our videos for expert FPV pilots. And this, this is the category of content on Instagram that we're big fans of, uh, where, where, you know, people sort of pose the question like Skydio or FPV. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's some anecdotal evidence there. Uh, realistically, the, as you know, like the world's best FPV pilots are just capable of absolutely incredible things. The other side of that, the dirty secret of that, you don't see these videos is that they crash all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So they, they never post their crash videos. Um, their success rate is definitely not 100%. Uh, I'm interested in Hike's answer to this as well. I think that the the best FPV pilots have kind of a, a longer term semantic planning thing that they're doing that I think is beyond where we are right now. I think there's a combination of, of kind of like scene understanding, thinking many seconds into the future uh, that is is beyond where where our system is right now. Um, you know, I think we see some paths to get there, like getting, I think there's an incremental path to get there through getting better at the perception and planning things that we're doing today. Um, but to me, that's probably the, the biggest one is, is sort of like the higher level, longer term planning at the, at the tactical skill layer. I think we do quite well. Um, and there's probably, I mean, I think there's some, some obvious ways where we're some of it just through hardware, but like we can fly backwards and avoid obstacles in a way that a, a human pilot can. 
Um, and I think at the sort of tactical seal layer and the, the sort of reactions we can do, we, we do quite well. Um, but at the higher levels, there's there's still something missing there. Yeah, I would I would just add that I think I'm a terrible drone pilot, but I think the best pilots have some amazing open loop behavior that they learn from practice. That's kind of muscle memory. Um, that that's uh, certainly not something that that our system does, and is again kind of points to uh, learning as a possible way to to augment that. Um, and and I think. You know, I would say one of the things that you know it's it's there to be chased. I think it's a, it's a really exciting engineering and research problem. Um, it's not one that we've spent uh, you know as much time going towards because I think the level of dynamic performance we're at now is is really good enough to chase these higher level applications. Um, but I would absolutely love to to spend time on that, and I, I think there's a lot of exciting work to be done in that direction, um, as as you well know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe if, if we become a big company like Google, we can have the like AlphaGo versus uh, versus human pilot competitions, which is something I would love to uh, love to do. <laughs> what is hindering you from uh, uh, flying faster? Is it uh, perceptual latency? Is it uh, decision making? What is it? You can take that height. Sure. Yeah, I think it 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 depends on the platform. I think um, for Skydio two, uh, there's well, there's one, there's the propulsion system. Um, so there's the amount of power that you can draw from the onboard power system. Um, two, there's aerodynamic effects. So there's a trade-off with, um, uh, you know, just drag, quadratic drag and other things that, that start to really hurt that power story um, and can make control difficult. And three, I think there's the performance envelope of Obstacle avoidance uh, is probably the, the most active constraint is just if you need to have the ability to stop, if you suddenly see a brick wall, um, then it's, you know, it is a lot more challenging. So we, we do things like try to stay further away from things when we're flying quickly and um, see, see ahead in various ways. But uh, at the end of the day, if we allow people to fly fast enough that it causes um, a much higher rate of collision, that's, that's, that's bad. Um, and Maybe there's you know this idea of the sport mode where you just don't have obstacles and you're able to fly faster, um, but it's uh, maybe not so well aligned with what we're trying to do at Skydio of maintaining that kind of envelope of autonomy. Yeah. So one of the biggest issues today uh, for today's robotic systems is safety. So how do you certify Skydio? Yeah, it's a good, it's an interesting question. I actually think. One of the things that's exciting about the space that we're in and the emphasis that we've put on uh, lightweight, relatively low cost hardware is that I, I think we can afford to be more aggressive um, than in other kinds of contexts, which is uh, is exciting from an application and development standpoint. Um, so, you know, our, our system today is is incredibly performant and capable and uh, and incidents are, are quite rare, but it's, it, we don't, you know, it's not crash proof. And certainly if you put it in a challenging enough environment, um, things can go wrong, but the level of performance that we're at today already has a, a really high ROI for our customers, both in the consumer and the industrial world. I mean, in, in the industrial world, a single flight could be worth more than the cost of the drone, um, because of the, the value of the data that you capture sometimes many more times the, the, the cost of the drone. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're flying in environments where you're keep, you know, you're preventing somebody from having to get on a ladder and climb up on a roof or scrape around the underside of a bridge where there's, there's great physical risk. Uh, so, I, you know, I think one of the, it's not the, the sort of the most appealing answer, but I think one of the pragmatic answers, which is, is good news for the space is that the, we're already above the bar, I would say, where, uh, the performance is, is, is massively beneficial to customers. Um, and, and the size and weight of the system is, is a big piece of that. Like the smaller and lighter you are, the, the better the worst case scenarios become. Um, beyond that, I think, I, I believe ultimately that it, it really needs to be a data story. I don't think that there's, um, you know, the, the real world environments are so complex that there's no like sort of offline traditional sort of like static analysis, anything that's going to tell you that your system is safe. You need data, flight data that's representative of the situations that you care about, um, and then you need ways of of regressing against and, and validating against that flight data. 
and Hike alluded to this, but we've invested enormous amounts in the system infrastructure that allows us to do that. So every time we're flight testing, we're logging every single thing about the sensors, the internal system. We have massive infrastructure that stores all that log data. We've built tools that make it easy to tag logs and, and run automatic software regressions against them. And all of that builds up to the point where anytime we make a change to the software system, we can either automatically or with very little effort validate it against thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of flight hours and measure the performance. And I think that ultimately safety verification is, is going to, the more important it becomes to certify safety, which does become more important as you go up in size and weight, I believe the right answer is going to be things of that flavor. Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, I think a lot of the work that's done in sort of verifiable performance of control systems and motion planning systems, I think those are really interesting and, and relevant. Um, but once you add vision, you don't have any guarantees and uh, it's all, you know, it, so any guarantees you make at that lower level, like they're, they're great, but you, you can't extend that to the entire system. So I think that's what motivates the data story. Okay. So I don't want to take too much time. So I give you, um, I give the word back to Alberto. Great, thank you. Um, excellent questions, uh, Margarita and Tapide. Um, I think we're gonna move now to questions from the audience. Um, and uh, anytime, Margarita and Tapide, just especially if Adam and Hike they're not really answering the question, feel free to jump in just to, uh, <laughs> to hold them accountable. <laughs> um, I think Benoit is gonna go next. Yeah, I'll get us started uh, with a question that was actually asked pretty early on, but I think picked up like a lot of traction online uh, as soon as it was asked. Uh, people are interested in if you would explore kind of more end-to-end -end version of your uh, autonomy stack. So it sounds like your perception is kind of already very close to that, uh, but your control is very much kind of MPC driven. Um, have you guys tried replacing that with like a pixel to torque style controller, for example? Yeah, how much, how much have we said publicly about this? Like yeah. <laughs> yes. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a really interesting direction. I mean, I think the, at a, uh, well, whatever we've said, I publicly, I'll let, I'll let Hike speak to, but like the, in the, in general, the, I think the, the trend that I see is these, you know, the modular systems built on sort of first principle techniques have a lot of advantages, um, for them. And certainly I think that's, you know, that's, that basically was robotics up until seven, eight years ago. Um, and our system reflects that kind of modular architecture. But what we see over time is more of those blocks being based on machine learning and then those blocks unifying um, in, in ways where you, you know, you, different pieces are based on learning and then they merge together. Um, and you know, I, I certainly don't think it's, I think there's a lot of advantages to, to more end-to-end -end learn uh, techniques. And it's something that we've, Hike will, Hike will say what we've, uh, what we've done there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's something we definitely think about and and draw out architectures. And uh, we've had a couple of PhD research interns, um, uh, Greg Kahn and Somil Banzel, both of which were fantastic, where we explored these um, more directly, and uh, especially combining kind of the supervision of our motion planning system with uh, learning kind of reinforcement learning based strategy and linking that to perception and exploring those topics. And I think we've seen some exciting results that validate the direction, but I also think the technology there is early um, in terms of being able to kind of displace the system that we have. Um, so it's, it's certainly an exciting area to explore. We published a, a blog post about some of those learnings where we actually flew kind of a basic system that did some obstacle avoidance and subject following kind of in a more end-to-end -end manner um, where we yeah, there's some obstacle information that's fed to a learned system that ultimately spits out a trajectory to follow. Um, and I, I think that's, yeah, it's exciting. I encourage anyone who is really, you know, wants to push the limits of that into kind of competing with our, our current system. I would, I would love to, you know, get your interest there and get to a point where we have a, a tiny drone that's running, a, you know, a, a sparse network on an ASIC and, uh, doing core navigation with a tiny amount of power. That would be amazing. The, I think one other comment just on the general area, this is something that we think about a lot from a, you know, ultimately it comes to like the team that we're trying to build. I think the, the uh, where we see the most success is in 
applying kind of a deep understanding of the first principles and an understanding of the physics of the problem. Uh, even if you're using heavily machine learning based techniques, I think the, the folks that kind of understand the first principles and the physics and understand the learning and can, can craft the, the sort of overall information flows and training methodologies to exploit those. Uh, I think that, that leads to the, the most success. I think the, the kind of like come up with just a super general machine learning technique and, and throw it at the problem tends to not work as well as, as really understanding the, the physics and the first principles and crafting the learning to, to exploit the structure of the problem. Especially if you care about efficiency. Yeah. Wait, uh, can, I, can I jump in just to uh, follow up on that? Do you mean high efficiency, like power efficiency or engineering efficiency, uh, like development time or what kind of efficiency? Uh, I meant, I meant computational efficiency, but oh, I, okay. I think, you know, you could argue that developer time is less if you don't have to, you can, you can just use a fixed deep network and you don't have to worry about the problem specific thing, but there's also lots of intermediate outputs, right? Like if you think about an end to end system, um, the, the obstacle map is still used by a huge number of components that are higher level so that, you know, having that as a concept is a, a very valuable thing within the system. Um, and, and there's lots of other examples of, of that. So uh, that, that, that suggests that building um, intermediate representations and structure into even an end-to-end -end learning thing uh, is very useful for a, a real product. Great, thanks. Um, Robert, I think you're going next. Absolutely. So um, John Hansman from MIT asked a, an interesting question. I think you touched upon it a little bit in terms of failure cases, but um, I think one of the bigger things is, you know, what failure rates are you seeing in the data that you log and collect? And what do you have like a automated process to learn from those failure cases to, you know, to fix them for the future? Yeah. So. We don't, I mean, we, we don't publish um, failure rates. What I would say is that I think it's, it's, it is highly variable depending on the use case, the use mode. So for something like uh, roof inspection, for example, uh, you know, we're, we, we tolerate way fewer failures than a mountain biker who knows they're taking some risk when they're going at high speeds through a forest with a bunch of thin branches. Um, and for every use case, you know, we're, we're over a threshold where the ROI uh, is, is there for, for our customers. Um, but there's, there's quite a bit of variability based on the customer and, and what they're doing. Um, and as you would expect, like on the industrial enterprise end of things, um, folks are a little bit more conservative. The obstacle avoidance challenges are a little bit easier. Uh, and we perform um, with, with, with very high degrees of reliability, like way beyond what I think people typically see with, with more manually flown drones under manual operation. In terms of addressing the failures, uh, an overall system goal is to have improved system improvement be as automated as possible. You know, the ideal situation is you get data back uh, and with, with basically no effort, just having that data enables you to fix the problem. Um, there are probably a couple of cases where we, we have a good approximation with, of that, but there's a long tail down to, to issues that um, are kind of this, what I think is called like grad student in the loop gradient descent, where we're, uh, you know, we're, we have, we spend a lot of time kind of like introspecting the data. We have a lot of tools to do that uh, and figure out ways to improve it. So that the trajectory is towards like fully automated improvement. And that's one of the advantages of applying more and more machine learning. But the reality is, and we have some areas that, that are, are, um, are like that, but uh, there's, you know, there's a long tail of stuff that's still very much like person in the loop. And, and I don't see that going away anytime soon. I think that that's, you know, if you're out there kind of pushing the envelope, discovering new flavors of problems, um, it's going to take smart people looking at it and thinking about it to figure out how to solve it, even if the solution is machine learning flavored. Yeah. So getting, getting the data back by itself is a big challenge. You know, one, if it's, if it's our flight test team flying, then fantastic. But if it's, you know, if it's PG&E flying at a, a substation, then they may not want to send us that data. And if they do, it may be, you know, 50 gigabytes for one battery's worth of flying. So it's a, it's a huge challenge to get that back. And second, the, the problem as it relates to obstacle avoidance, especially is that we don't have ground truth labels for that data. So it's, um, it, there's definitely a gap to figure out 
how best to use that data um, in, in various ways for various types of improvements um, that we've spent a lot of time focusing on. But ultimately you get, you know, you get data about a crash and you, you don't get the direct supervision you need there to improve. Um, so there has to be extra steps. Um, hey, Adam, hi. Um, thanks again for that great talk. So I just wanted to pick up uh, a few audience questions that go in the same direction. I, I actually found it also really interesting to hear that you're using learning-based methods for depth estimation because just a few days ago, I heard a talk by TRI uh, from the robotics side where they're working with manipulation robots and they're actually also using a learning-based methods and stereo cameras for their depth estimation and then uh, localization. So I thought it was really interesting to hear that. And there are a few questions um, from the audience on that as well. So um, for example, someone asked um, if you could talk a little bit more about the lim limitations you faced uh, when using just you know traditional methods and stereo cameras for depth estimation and that made you basically opt for these learning-based methods. Uh, for example, the thin, thin structures um, you've shown, uh, people are wondering about that. And then apart from this method for depth estimation, people are also wondering about why 360 cameras, why not LIDAR or ultrasonic, or why not um, event-based cameras? I was wondering about that. Okay, I can start with the first thing about the why the deep learning is, is useful and why a, uh, a classical approach may fail. So uh, maybe, a, maybe a textualist wall is a, a simple example to start with. So if you see a large region that's basically white, um, if you match, typically what you would do is you would take a pixel from one camera. Um, if you have a rectified stereo pair, say you would search along the epipolar line um, to look for what the best match is and you might pull out some kind of feature patch that's a local patch. Um, now, the obvious problem there is that if you pull out a patch and you compare at multiple depths, that kind of cost curve you'll get is will be totally flat because it's textureless, so it's, it's just equal. Um, for a thin structure, what you'll get is often within that patch, the thin object is a small part of it. So what you'll get is you'll match the background more than the foreground, so you're liable to miss it. Um, if you have sun glare, then you might have this big white streak that comes through. That's a very strong kind of photometric feature and you might be more likely to match just a totally inconsistent sun ray in the other image. Um, so in, in all these cases, it's, it's just very hard to pull out a photometric feature that's handcrafted that is able to match successfully and, and also regularize um, for the, you know, the, the white wall case. Like what you really wanna do is pull in from the edges of the scene and understand something about the context. Um, and for the thin branch cases you want more intelligent features that can capture a foreground element. And it's just incredibly difficult to think about how to code such a thing, um, such a feature. Uh, so that's kind of, I think, the root of where um, the learning really shines towards that problem. And then maybe related to that, can you talk about the training data that you use for this? Like, I, I guess you can't, can you use the, the driving data sets that actually exist there or do you have to have your own data? We definitely need our own data, um, I think. A, a data set like Kitty um, or, or typical car data set is just a, a, a much more limited domain, I would say, um, that typically will have a ground plane and buildings. And um, that's a type of scenario where I think, yeah, it's, it's, it, it can be useful, but largely it's, we, we don't use it and it's just too limited of a, of a domain. Um, it also kind of points to why, um, I think in those domains, monocular cameras and, and uh, monocular depth estimation is a lot more compelling because you tend to have more of a uh, standard uh, semantic priors that you can rely on, known objects of a fixed size, um, whereas the drone can take off and fly somewhere that's just um, you know, a bushel of, of trees that you don't really have um, that kind of information. Uh, so definitely large efforts on our end to, to build data. Um, what was the second? Question? The second was on more the hardware side, like why 360 um, cameras and why not lighter or ultrasonic or event-based? <laughs> yeah, so we, I mean, we, we really, when we started in 2014, we made a big bet on computer vision, which in, in, 20, in that time frame, uh, there were very sparse results of people doing any kind of autonomous flight based on computer vision. I think 
obstacle avoid just doing state estimation based on computer vision was was just starting to be demonstrated um, and obstacle avoidance seemed even more of a, of a stretch. Um, so cameras, I think, are a really appealing sensor because the, the information is just so rich. I mean, it's, it's obviously the primary sensing mode for humans. You get, um, you know, the, in addition to, to depth information, you get, if you can extract the depth, you get kind of like everything you would need to semantically understand the scene. Um, so uh, in terms of kind of size, weight, cost, and information richness, I think cameras are still unbeatable. Uh, LIDAR is, is obviously getting better. Um, and I think the more that LIDARs get into kind of mobile phone class, uh, size, weight, cost, the, the more interesting they'll become for drones. But even with the best systems out there, like the, the iPhone 12 is, is a pretty compelling example, like in terms of the range and performance of that sensor, I think it's still pretty significantly far from what you would want for, for uh, an autonomous drone. Um, but it's, you know, it's on an interesting, promising trajectory. Um, yeah. Hey guys, um, I wanted to follow up. Uh, first of all, like, you know, the talk is just amazing. Like, you know, it's, it's mind blowing. Um, I have a weird question to start with, and then a technical question. Um, let me start with the weird question. So um, imagine that you can pick one of the following, right? So you, you can pick between infinite computation, more powerful batteries, better sensors along the question that Jeanette was asking, or infinite training data. Which one of those would you pick for the future of SkyView? Let's say the future next five years, right? So let's say short term. And again, it's more computation, better batteries, better sensors, or more training data? That's an interesting question. Heike and I might have different answers here. Um, we should <laughs> make, make us each write it down and then uh, <laughs> they, I like, I. Uh... Wait, 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 wait. You should, you should give your answer at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Think, think All about right. it. No, we'll just, 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 just write it down. We'll be on our honor system here. I'll, I'll okay, say okay. compute. <laughs> I think compute is a, is a, um, and I'll qualify that a little bit. I mean, I think that anything compute ends up not being like a hard barrier anywhere, but it's a barrier to speed of development. Um, and the more compute we have available, the quicker we can move because the less time we need to spend on, on optimization and the more time we can spend invent, inventing new stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll say compute. Yeah, I was, I was also thinking compute, but battery was a, a close second. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think this, like the software, there's so much to do with the software that if we can, if we didn't have to worry about that, we, we could move a lot faster. Um, and I guess to kind of add on to that is if, if we could do things a lot more efficiently, then we could have a smaller computer and maybe we could fly for longer and be smaller as well. So that'd be a benefit. Oh, that's, that's, uh... Very interesting. I would argue that uh, probably eighty percent of our audience was betting on uh, on uh, more training data, but uh, but it was great actually to see that you guys are. Uh, we have a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, we've got a lot of data. Yeah, uh, and indeed, the, the second part is about uh, you know I want to keep going like you know more on the technical side on the about machine learning. I want to go back to the machine learning, and the question is the following. So, my understanding of what you guys presented is that uh, for the three scan three D scan part. For the online data collection, you use this uh, like you know um, deep network for depth reconstruction, which uh, you know you integrate in 3D and so on. Um, and then offline, there is this uh, photometric reconstruction, this uh, photogrammetry based reconstruction, which is very accurate. I was curious about the second part, the offline version, which is creating these amazing maps, like you know these amazing 3D meshes. Is there any de learning involved in that step, or is it just pure computer vision? So we're, well, I, could, I mean, we're applying the same core computer vision engine that we use online, um, which uses, uh, I mean, it's, it's the same recipe book that we have online that we're applying offline. Yeah, I'll add the, the models that I showed at the very start, like those are processed by an external photogrammetry package. Um, so the 3D scan right now is, is doing the capture part of it. Now, obviously we're, we're you know, we're very interested in, in that aspect. And I think a lot of, like Adam said, all of our core technology does line up for that. And again, you're optimizing for some very different things, um, but uh, deep learning absolutely has a, a role to play there. Um, I think it's 
if you look at photogrammetry packages out there, um, most of them are based off, I mean, th there are some very good solutions, but most of them are based off things that were developed, uh, you know, about 10 years ago. And, and uh, let me just push back on that. So uh, the reconstructions are clearly amazing, right? And uh, uh, they are offline because it will take probably, you know, a few hours to, to reconstruct. But if they're already amazing with traditional computer vision, where do you see learning, like, you know, playing a role? Because it seems that, you know, textureless surfaces and so on in post-processing, these are working out, right? Um, yes, I think there's a couple of aspects. One, uh, typically when you're capturing this type of data, you, you're trying to make it a good photometric scene, right? You don't want a bright sunset in the background. You don't want, um, all the difficult conditions that we were looking at. You're trying to minimize those. So that makes the problem a lot less about robustness and a lot more about accuracy. Um, so that, that's what helps the, the, you know, photometric approaches succeed. Um, but you still have those types of effects, like absolutely textualist regions do fail um, all the time. Um, things like moving objects in water do fail. If you have a sky in the background or bright sun glare, they, they absolutely do fail. Um, and then the other thing I'll mention is just from a raw speed perspective, uh, I, you know, people commonly will run jobs for days or weeks, or like I mentioned, I've even heard months of processing time. Um, so that I think is also something that could really be helped. Great answer. Thanks guys. I have one last question. Um, I would like to ask, are your drones reasoning such that they obey the first law of robotics? So for example, if a collision is unavoidable, would the drone select to hit some obstacle rather than a person? That's above my pay grade, Adam. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have, um... We have kind of like escalating costs and priorities within the system, um, and the the highest cost is the the stuff that we think is 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 people. And we actually, I mean, we have some like even more stringent fallback constraint things that we do uh, at at the very end, um, which we uh, we have certainly exercised internally to test them. Um, so, yeah. Um, as we wrap up, I would like to thank our speakers, Hayek and Adam, again, for such an amazing talk. Um, I'd also like to thank our panelists, Davide and Margarita, uh, for joining us, as well as our student panel uh, panelists, Benoit and Robert. Um, and thank all of you for tuning in. Our next scheduled seminar will be March 12th, um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you guys so much for having us. This was a lot of fun.